uh, adolescence, which uh, I'd like to touch on, but it, it, uh, uh, without dwelling on it too much, unless you want to take it further, that is you were, you were misdiagnosed, as I understand it, as a schizophrenic. What effect did it have on your life as a, as a, a boy and a young man? I mean, it, it, it's interesting because, uh, in actual fact, what it says in the doctor, the psychiatrist notes, is if I were urged in his own handwriting to, to make a diagnosis at this stage, I might say borderline, borderline personality, brackets, schizoid. And you see, in a sense, the fact of it returning again and again to me is more like one of my own fictional conceits. You know, I've thrown out this as a... The fact of the matter was it was written there, and when I came to... Uh, call up my medical notes and found that it was written there. It, in a sense, explained, in my mind, an external point from which to judge my own sense of conflict during that period, my own sense of quite acute dissociation. Um, it certainly did happen, you know. Was there a sort of breakdown? I mean, did you go to hospitals and have uh, psychiatrists attend to you and that sort of thing? Well, I did have a fairly turbulent time. Yes, I ended up in casualty a couple of times in suicidal states. I ended up at one point being prescribed, you know, quite strong uh, antipsychotic and tranquilizing drugs. And, uh, you know, I ended up under psychiatric care of various sorts for a number of years, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't one breakdown in that sense. Yeah. And, of course, it was all involved with, uh, you know, with, with uh, use of illegal drugs as well. So it was quite difficult to tell where yeah, one stopped and how it began, yeah. When did you start taking drugs? Was this the, in early adolescence? Well, you know, the current administration would seem to have us believe that none of us are free of drugs at any time at all, and indeed I think that's true in an absolute sense. It seems to me that uh, the point at which, you know, self-stimulus and uh, intoxication merge is very hard to divine. I mean, I, I don't say that by way of trying to evade the question, but it, I say it by way of a manifesto on the subject. As it happened, I think I probably first started smoking it in my early teens, 13, 14. Did the taking of illegal drugs become something uh, that was directing as well as affecting your life? I think very early on, yes. And even looking back at it now, I mean, it was, in answer to your question, it was all mixed up together. You know, mm -hmm. you have a turbulent adolescence, you start taking drugs which derange your senses, you feel unhappy, you get more deranged. You take more drugs, you know, any, any parent who's seen their own child go through this can tell you what it looks like. Yeah. And it's all part and parcel of the same thing. How can it not be? There's a lot of bad medicine mixed up in that brew. But even now, looking back on, back, back on it, uh, I find it difficult to, you know, feel completely negative about it. Recovering at a private clinic like Broadway Lodge costs nearly £700 a week, but some patients here spent twice that on their habit. I was a physical wreck. I was covered in, in the kinds of sores you can see healing here all over my face as well and body. I was underweight. Uh, I felt almost permanent fatigue, bad sleep, bad digestion, the works. You've spent around £20,000 one way or another trying to kick the habit. Is this going to work? It's got to, or I'm going to die. Heroin is a drug of anesthesia. It's a drug that creates euphoria by removing the capacity to feel rather than by actually giving you euphoria. And the effect of withdrawing from it is a kind of obscene image hunger, a craving for images and for imagery. And certain of the torrents of imagery in my work, I think, are very much a attempt to uh, recapitulate that sort of experience. I don't write when intoxicated. Marijuana is great for notes. I think that it has had a profound and I think lasting influence on certain kinds of not so much lateral as fissioning creativity. You can, you can be working on an idea all day and then I think the influence of marijuana would be to almost look at it in terms of another medium, to look at literature in terms of sculpture, as it were. This is a very strange building put up to house the uh, burial chamber inside. Built about four and a half, perhaps even 5,000 years ago. 
I'm never very happy about coming in here. I, uh, I think it, uh, it carries quite a charge, this place. I think in, uh, in this part of the world, it's considered a pretty foolhardy thing to come in here late at night and attempt to spend some time here, particularly in an altered state of mind. The uh, bodies would have been excarnated, perhaps even by sea eagles, and then it was a sort of ossuary. It has almost the feel, as you look down it, of some sort of strange thanatological spaceship heading off into another dimension, and I certainly feel the weight of the idea of a very different and very strange kind of psyche coming off it. The people who came here originally pushed up the, uh, the coast of the British Isles, they may have been animists, they may have been organized into clans or tribal systems, they may have taken some of the indigenous animals as their totems. They built these extremely large chamber tombs. Uh, and then we don't really know what happened to them, but I think Orkney uh, is paradoxical in terms of the, the hold it has on the imagination. It's been more heavily inhabited in the past than it is now, and uh, during the Neolithic period, it was uh, one of the most populated places in the British Isles. So presumably every stone, every field, every blade of grass, in a way, has been dwelt upon. I think, I mean, it, it may be a result of having spent many, many long hours in this room alone writing things. But I think in a place where the evidence of the past lies heavier upon the face of the earth than the evidence of the present, that it's not hard to start involving yourself in ideas of full temporal simultaneity and when you load into that rather heavy notion the idea that all times may be going on simultaneously in some sense uh, the idea of the collective consciousness of the uh, of the builders of Midhow of the great chambered tomb you have a rather heady little psychic mixture but that may be as much a result of sitting here on dark winter nights spinning up other strange possibilist worlds just as in a speeded up stop action film of the city, of the traffic moving in the city, you'll see the lineaments of mass behavior beginning to shine through. You know, this is like a single frame as far as I'm concerned. This is uh, the Brock at Midhow on Rouse in Orkney. It's a Pictish fortified dwelling house that was built, I think, between about the first and fourth century AD. They're rather enigmatic buildings. They would have been shaped originally a bit like Didcot power station cooling towers. They would have sort of sloped up like this with a rather sinuous curve. The only intact one in Shetland's about 60 feet high. And they think that a clan or extended family would have lived inside one of these. There was a, there were window, there were little cells, cubicular rooms in the inner skin of the thing with staircases running up and then here in the middle, the old quern is still here that they would have ground their beer, the local old uh, barley in. And I find them a weird sort of linkage, very enigmatic buildings standing here at the edge of the world. Uh, and nobody really knows what they were about, the Brocks. I think for me, you know, that the island is very much a sort of parallel world. It's a microcosmic world, and its history makes me feel that I'm somehow decoupled from the rest of the world. And uh, I suppose in a weird way, this mini Brock here in a London inner city garden resembles in a way the, the relationship of, the, of my fiction to reality. You know, it's, it's, uh, my stories uh, bear this rather tangential relationship to naturalism and to the world as we see it around us. You said once or twice that your writing comes out of a sort of boredom. Is that something you'd hold to? Well, I, th I think the boredom, I'm, if I were to be honest with myself, that I'm really talking about is not so much a boredom as an exasperation at my inability to write. Paradoxically, what drove me to write was my fear that I couldn't. You know, it became so extreme that I had to kind of lance it and reinterest myself in myself and in the idea of working by doing it and, and keeping doing it. Would, that, would the word therapeutic be one that you'd dismiss instantly in that context? Well, only because it's the word therapeutic. <laughs> I mean, I think just because of all of the connotations of pathology and neurosis that come packed into that term and comes, come packed into people's apprehension of it, mm. it's certainly therapeutic. It's more 